Someone asked me this morning after the lesson if I had maybe an outline or something, and I can certainly put one to, together. Um, but I happen to think, just as we got up to uh, sing the song before the sermon, that if you have Nichols Pocket Bible Encyclopedia, and I know most of you do, you'll find much of the scriptures laid out in there if you just look up Sabbath. And uh, so if that may be a help to you to have more than even what I'll give, Nichols Pocket Bible Encyclopedia, and most of you know it's literally to go in your pocket. And if you'll just look at that up, that'll be helpful. But I'll try to put together an outline on this material. As you notice, if you studied with us this morning, I've basically been just looking at scriptures, reading the scriptures, and noticing how they fit in view of what Sabbatarians say in making a false division in the Old Testament, specifically the law of Moses, trying to say that, well, Ten Commandments never were set aside. They were always binding. It's what they call ceremonial law. And we've tried to show that it's all called the law of God. It's all the law of Moses. It's not just this belongs to their ceremonies, which many of what they call ceremony is still not ceremony. It's doing something. It's keeping commandments. And in that which they don't call that, it all fits under the general heading of the law of God or the law of Moses when it comes to that which was revealed by God to Moses for the children of Israel in Exodus chapters 19 and 20. But I'd like to begin this afternoon as we continue with these ideas with Exodus chapter 31. Chapter 31 of Exodus verses 16 and 17. Exodus 31, 16, 17. And we're looking at the words perpetual, forever, and generations. Now we got into some of this this morning but we read here what Moses wrote. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. To observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Now there's our three terms, perpetual, forever, and generations. Now, the Sabbatarians claim that since the Jews still have generations and that perpetual and forever do not end, you can see their conclusion. The Sabbath is still binding. But now are they consistent with this? Such contention will make binding also the following, which they do not make binding in their teaching. The Passover feast. Exodus 12 and verse 14. And this day shall be unto you a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Now you can't have, you can't pick and choose what you will hold and say, well, it's still binding. And then say, but we won't take the other when they're both described and set out in exactly the same way. In other words, you can't have the Sabbath day as binding upon people today and reject the Passover. One is just as much binding as is the other. Notice this concerning perpetual incense in Exodus chapter 30 and verse number 8. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at evening, he shall burn it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Exodus 30, verse 8. Well, do the Sabbatarians have incense burning the same way as they bind the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath? What about burnt offerings? In Exodus 29, verse 42, Moses wrote, it shall be a continual burnt offering offering throughout your generations continual burnt offering throughout your generations can't have the sabbath and not have the passover feast 
might have the matter of the lamps being lit and then the burnt offering right along with it. Well, I don't see that going on among these who say that the Sabbath is the day to worship God. It's interesting, um, there's so much regulated under the law of Moses that uh, you have this comment made about fringes that would go around the edge of a garment. Fringes, F-R-I-N-G-E-S. Numbers 15 and verse 38 reads, Speak thou unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations. Now, if that means it's never going to end, I know that's going to make for some interesting clothing for everybody. I wondered, where would I put my fringes on, on this? Well, I'm not trying to just make a lot of something. I'm saying if you're going to bind the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath, on us today as it was bound up on the Jews under the law of Moses, then the other things we've mentioned here go right along with it. And to bind one and exclude the other, you just have to do it arbitrarily. And that's not following all that the Scriptures teach if you hold that you're to do these particular matters like we, they do as far as the Sabbath is concerned. So the same terms which describe their duration describe the Sabbath day's duration. The facts are that the people, according to the great prophet Isaiah, the people, the children of Israel, broke the covenant, Isaiah 24, 5. And then God was not obligated to keep his side of the covenant, Zechariah chapter 11, verses 10 and 11. It's always been a conditional thing with God when it comes to saving our souls, saving the Jews' souls, or back in the patriarchal age, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, saving their souls. God expected them to submit to whatever he obligated them to do to demonstrate their faith in him to save them. And he would do thus and so. But if you chose to reject it, to not abide by it, then he was not obligated to continue to bless you sort of interesting there in the garden when man had access to the tree of life. But it was only so long as he had no sin in his life. And notice that God from the very beginning, when man sinned in the garden, he was sent out of the garden and was not allowed to eat the tree of life because he had sinned. And again, as somebody prayed a while ago, sin's our greatest enemy. We can talk about cancer. We can talk about wars in the Ukraine or wars here. We can talk about famines and starvation and all that kind of stuff. But they end with this life. But not so when it comes to sin separating us from God. Sin is the transgression of God's law, John says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. And Romans 3, 24 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6 and verse um, 23 says plainly that the wages of sin is death. That's my concern. I don't care whether I'm a pauper or whether I have more money than anybody else and I earned it all honestly. And I'm using it all I can to help everybody else. And everything like that, I'm still going to die. And I'm not going to take one red cent with me. Thus, if I can't send my treasure on ahead waiting on me in heaven... And the way the Bible teaches a Christian can, then what do we do? If all we have in this life is this life and this fleshly body, it doesn't take a genius to look around, even in this room, and see some of us are a lot farther along headed toward eternity than others, and none of us are, are any further away from eternity than one heartbeat. And then what? It's like the ruler who was a rich farmer and couldn't think of anything but him. Had all this great produce, tear down my barns, build bigger barns. Well, God had something to say about things, didn't he? He said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, and then who shall all these things be? So I'm concerned about rightly dividing the word of truth 2 Timothy 2.15, as I study the Bible, so I'll know the truth about not only the law of Moses, 
but about the law of Christ, the perfect law of liberty, and how God extends salvation to me today. Now, the law of the Sabbath. The law of the Sabbath. The Ten Commandments, sometimes people refer to as the Decalogue, which the, remember, the Sabbatarians claim to be eternally binding on all people, all nations, contains the bare command to remember the Sabbath day. The Ten Commandments contain no penalty for Sabbath violation. You ever notice that? You read all Ten Commandments, and there's no penalty for Sabbath violation. Well, the law without a penalty is no law. It can't be enforced. Sabbatarians must go to what they call the law of Moses. But it's been taken out of the way according to their doctrine to find the penalty for Sabbath violation. And then they declare this law has been nulled. That is, what they say. We're using their terms because of the false distinction they make. They say the law of Moses has been moved out of the way. All right. More. They have God giving the eternal law and Moses giving the law to enforce it. It meets itself coming back because of the false distinction they make that the Bible doesn't. Furthermore, outside of what they call the ceremonial law, they can find no penalty, as I say, for the infraction of the Sabbath law. And this again makes the greater rest on the less. But what was required on the Sabbath? Rest. What was the nature of the rest which the children of Israel were to participate in? What was the nature of it? No work to be engaged in by them or their children or their servants or their cattle, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 19. Well, that means they can't cook dinner. <laughs> they can't prepare food. Listen to Exodus 16. Exodus 16 and verse 23. This is that which the Lord hath spoken. Tomorrow is a solemn rest, a holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will bake, and boil that which you will boil. And all that remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. Now watch this as to their staying in one place, abiding in one place. In Exodus 16 and verse 29, The Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread for two days. Abide ye every man in his place, let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. All right, let's go further. We'll just make mention of this, what is called the showbread, was to be prepared and renewed every Sabbath. First Chronicles 9, verse 32, and Leviticus 24, verses 8 and 9. Let's see further what was done to prepare for the Sabbath. Two lambs were sacrificed every day, and on the Sabbath, two additional lambs were sacrificed. Numbers, chapter 28, Verses 1 through 10. And this was the law for every Sabbath. If there's a Sabbath now, it is necessarily one of every Sabbath. And two additional lambs must be sacrificed and the table of showbread attended to. Well, are these people who are binding these things, let's use a Sabbath day as God's will for us today, are they doing these things? These things belong to every Sabbath. If the Sabbath continues, so must these services continue. If these services have ended, so has the observance of the seventh day or the Sabbath. Notice also about building or kindling a fire. Exodus chapter 35 and verse 3. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. 
Well, look at the penalty. Exodus chapter 35 and verse 2. Whosoever doeth any work therein shall be put to death. Can't get plainer than that. And we see it carried out in Numbers chapter 15, verses 32 through 36. Now let's keep those things in mind, realizing that they were binding on every Israelite as long as the law of Moses was binding on them. The distinctions the Sabbatarians make today between the law of God and the law of Moses do not exist. They are the same thing. Now I want you to look at circumcision and its relationship to the Sabbath. I don't know whether some people think about this or not as to the law's regulation of circumcision, but also then how does it harmonize with the law on the Sabbath? You'll remember that the law of Moses required the circumcision of the male child on the eighth day after its birth. This, say the Sabbatarians, was a ceremonial law. The law required rest on the Sabbath day. And the law required the male child to be circumcised on the eighth day after its birth. Does it take too much thinking to see a possible problem here? If a child was eight days old, on the Sabbath day, and some would have been, one of these laws had to be broken. Question, which one? Go with me to the New Testament, to John chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. Jesus is speaking. John 7, beginning verse 22, Moses hath given you circumcision, Look what he says in parentheses. Not that it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And on the Sabbath ye circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you wroth with me? Because I made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath. He had worked a miracle on the Sabbath to healed a person. They were mad because he healed a person of his malady on the Sabbath day. Well, the law says you can't do any work on the Sabbath day. They failed to ask the question, what kind of work did God have in mind that a man must not do and would suffer death if he did on the Sabbath? But you see here the Sabbath law was broken in order to observe the law of Moses. But there's more to it than that. Jesus said to the Jews in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 11, What man shall there be of you that shall have one sheep, and if this fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? As far as I know, laying hold on a sheep and lifting it out of the hole of the ground can be a little bit, uh, involve a little activity on your part. A lot of it having to do with how deep the pit is and how cooperative the sheep is. <laughs> the point is, that's work. Nobody's going to say that's not work. Will they violate the Sabbath? they performing acts of mercy. Notice, mercy to a poor dumb brute. They fail to see in both these instances that one law takes priority over another law. Let me give you an example that happened to me many years ago. Jody was with me and the kids were little. I was working at the um, Tully Children's Home. We lived in Sperry. And up there they got mountains. So we were just across the mountain from where the home was. But I spoke at different places around Tulsa. And I had been asked to speak that day, uh, evening service, in the Sand Springs, Oklahoma, congregation. And that was probably, I don't remember now, 40 miles away, I'm guessing, roughly so. And we had to go from Sperry up over the mountain, back down through Tulsa, onto the interstate, and then on over to Sand Springs. Well, as we were going up the mountain, it was a windy road, two-lane road. 
We came around a curve, and here was all this dust and stuff all thrown out in the road for a length of roughly this auditorium or further. Well, I knew something had happened, and it had just happened. And the dust, as old saying goes, dust hadn't settled. Well, as we looked, and you couldn't look too close because it was going down that way, and the mountain went up this way. But as I looked, what had happened is that a man riding his motorcycle with his wife riding behind had lost control come around that curve, and when he hit the side of the road, he went right down in the ditch and just cleaned that ditch out for a distance of close to the length of this room. Well, you had to be careful where you stopped to try to get any help because it's so narrow. And I wasn't going to go by because he was, he was sitting there by his motorcycle. His wife was knocked out and he was cradling her head in his, in his lap. And when I got, I forgot, and I think I went up and turned around somewhere and came back down. It was so narrow. And um, I believe I stayed there with them, and you drove down to the house at the bottom of the mountain. And we called the ambulance or some way. I don't remember. I stayed with them. And what shook things up a little more than that, he said, she's uh, two or three months pregnant. So what do I do? They're expecting me for the Sunday evening worship services in Sand Springs. If I stay here as a good Samaritan and take care of them till proper help could arise, I can't be there. Well, in fact, I could be there, but I'm not sure when I'll get there, whether it'll be at the end of the service or whatever. Now, which law of God do you think took precedent over another? Was I obligated to assemble with the saints? Was I told not to forsake the assembly? Yes. But I think you have a great lesson on the Good Samaritan. Who is my neighbor? Anybody in need? How do you harmonize the two? Well, I did just exactly what you've got right here in John 7, 22 and 23 and Matthew 12, 11. One was more important than the other. One was in a different position than the other. And I stayed and helped the people the best I could till at least professional help got there. Then we went on old Sand Springs. And I remember we drove up. I think we're about 30 minutes late. <laughs> but the people were standing out looking, where, where, what happened to that preacher? Well, we managed just fine. You see, one of the rules of biblical hermeneutics is so important is common sense when it comes to reasoning what would you do? Well, what if you had been an atheist and you saw this thing happen and you had a place you needed to be and they were expecting you, but if you stop and help them, then you can't be over there where you're supposed to be at the time you're supposed to be there. Well, I think even an atheist, though he would not be able to give any kind of explanation how his atheist, atheism caused him to do it, his common sense would say, out of the milk of human kindness, I'll stay here and help these folks and it's not to be late wherever else I'm going. And that's all that's being said here when you read John 7, 22 and 23 and Matthew 12, 11. And he was basically saying, if you can understand that you ought to help a person by the very fact that you go out and get a dumb beast out of a pit, then you ought to know that's not the work that's forbidden on the Sabbath day and it's not the work that was forbidden when I healed this man on the Sabbath day. They were simply void of the neighborly attitude, of the benevolent attitude, of doing unto others as they would have them do unto them. The law of God, even under the law of Moses, did not stop people from doing good and doing good one time with one situation when there seems to be a conflict takes precedent over other situations. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. We don't realize sometimes that everything spoken aforetime about Jesus Christ as so, so that the Jews could identify him. They could recognize the Messiah. It was all spoken there in the prophets. You remember somebody saying one time, come, we have found him whom the prophet spoke of. How can they say that if they don't know what the prophet said about him? 
as they're identifying marks of the Lord's spiritual body, the church, found in the New Testament, they're identifying marks of the Old Testament of the Lord himself on this earth. And they could find it they wanted to. That's the reason the Lord said to those that persecuted him among the Jews, you closed your eyes to the truth. You wander in the darkness. And when the light hits you, you're like these little bugs come out from under a stump. You try to run back out of the light and get under that because you love darkness rather than light. That's exactly what he was saying. Now possibly the passage in Luke makes this clearer. That is Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I came not to destroy but to fulfill. In Luke 16 and verse 17 regarding this, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one piddle of the law to fall. That's a little mark, the smallest mark in Hebrew that you make. When you talk about being under law to Christ now and not under the Mosaic law, you're talking about how people approach God today. And Jesus said, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. But it doesn't make null and void the whole of inspired Old Testament writing. It just simply says that is not the authority today. Moses is not the authority. The prophets is not the authority. Who did they write of? Of Jesus Christ. In fact, Moses would say there will be a prophet raised up like unto me. Hear him and everything. You should have seen that. Christ didn't say that the law would stand till heaven and earth pass away, but that it would stand till it was fulfilled. He spoke not of the length of the law, but of the certainty of the fulfillment of the law. Now, question, did Christ fulfill the law? Luke 24 and 44, I think, makes it clear that he did. Now, when fulfilled, the law expired in its divine limitation because it never was meant to be that which would be preached to every creature. You'll never find anyone in the Old Testament that the Jew under the law of Moses was commanded to go into all the world and preach the law of Moses to every creature. It was never meant to be that way. It fulfilled its purpose, a schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ. It kept the Jews believing in God and it kept the people as the Jews were faithful keeping the name of God alive among all the pagan nations. And look how that went, if you know your Old Testament. But the point is, it did what it was intended to do. But when it had done it, what else else could it do? Thus, John the Baptist, who was the exact forerunner of the Christ, would point people to the Christ. Well, are you that prophet, they ask him? No, I'm not that prophet. Are you Elijah? No, I'm not. But when Christ came to the baptism of John, John would point to the Christ himself and say, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, which was not John. In fact, John would declare, I must decrease, and he must increase. He would say at his baptism, I'm not even worthy to unlatch the shoelaces on his sandals, which is all pointing to Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the way, the truth of the life, and the only way to God. Galatians 3.21, Paul said this about the law as he was combating Judaizing teachers, those who said, well, Gentiles can be saved, but they must be circumcised to keep the law. Here's what he said. If there had been a law given which could make alive, verily, which means truly, it's a fact, righteousness would have been by the law, but it couldn't. No flesh shall be justified by the law. It had its place, but it was to make sin exceeding sinful. I believe Eric talked about that when he said that one time. Made sin exceeding sinful. What does that mean? Made them fully aware they could not keep a law system perfectly. And when they violated one aspect of it, it condemned them. It made them have to look to somebody outside of themselves and outside of the human race to save them from their sins. And it would take a system of salvation through grace and obedience to the gospel. And when we do what the Word of God says we are to do, the gospel of Christ, 
God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16. We're not trying to merit anything. We're not trying to earn our salvation. We're trying to accept it on God's terms that it involves action on our part. I referred you some time ago to the matter of Genesis 6, one of the best places to go to show salvation by grace through obedient faith. Genesis 6, 8, Noah found grace, favor in God's sight. Immediately, the scripture goes and Moses records for us all the things about the ark, the dimensions of it, what it's made out of, the window, the door, the window. Oh, he said that part. <laughs> How it's uh, sealed up. And then it said of Noah, verse 22, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. That's action on his part. That's work on his part. He had to build the ark according to the pattern showed to him by God. That's not trying to merit salvation. That's not trying to come up with your own way of being saved. That's accepting God's way of being saved. But it involves action on the part of the person it is designed to save. Thus, James would say, faith without work is dead being alone. James 2. And also, you find in Hebrews 11, all those great worthies who by faith did this, by faith did that. And since faith comes by hearing the word of God, they act upon the word of God that God had given them, and they perform. Thus Noah built an ark to the saving of his house. And on the day of Pentecost, when people became Christians, the scripture says that Peter said, save yourselves from this perverse or crooked generation. Save themselves. How do you save yourself since God saves you? You accept what he said. You believe him. If he obligates you to do something, you discharge the obligation. And those people knew that. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2, verse 37. And they were told as believers, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and your children and all of them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Thus, we see that people have to make divisions in the law of Moses that the scriptures rightly divided do not make to try to say that the Sabbath is still binding today. The very reasoning that they do to try to do that would mean they would have to be doing many other things that would be and was enjoined upon the children of Israel while the law of Moses was in effect. Colossians 2.14 makes it clear that he took out these handwriting and forces, took them out of the way, and nailing them to his cross. So we're under a new and living way. And let me say again, uh, this is not just meant to advertise Ken's teaching on Hebrews, but when you get to the study of Hebrews, that point is going to be made over and over again as to Christ being the better high priest under a better system. And don't leave it because there's not another one to come. At the end of this Christian age, there's nothing but coming into judgment and entering into eternity. And there are only two places people are going to go after the judgment day. Eternal damnation and a devil's hell because they didn't live here on earth like the Bible told them. They spurned God, spurned his gospel, did as they pleased. Or they loved God and kept his commandments all the days of their life. They were steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For they knew their labor was not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And thus they will be in heaven forevermore. If you need to obey the gospel, we hope you'll do that today. So as a child of God, you sinned and you need to repent. We hope you will repent and come confessing those sins and pray God for forgiveness. We would be all glad to do that. In fact, we ought to be praying for one another all the time that we be faithful. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.